Hi, I'm Graham Blackburn and this is Traditional Woodworking by Hand. And in our continuing series on joinery, this episode is going to be about cross lap joints. As I've mentioned before, of uh, all the many books that I've written on woodworking, this one, Woodworking Techniques, is particularly useful for joinery. Up to this point, we've talked about edge joints, but now we're going to start talking about joints where one piece of wood goes to another piece of wood with different grain direction. With butt joints, you see that the grain is the same in both directions whether it's a simple plain butt joint or whether it's a stepped uh, butt joint uh, or whether it's even a tongue and grooved joint. The grain goes in the same direction. But what do we do when we need to start putting wood together where the grain is in different directions? Well, the simplest way is something called a cross lap joint. Uh, and this is an occasion for me to point out uh, the third great rule of woodworking, which is that if you've got to join two or more pieces of wood together, it invariably helps to mark the pieces because it's astonishing how many ways you can put wood together that you didn't intend. If you look at this very, very closely, you can see here that I've stamped the first initial of my first name, G, and right here you can see there's a B. So this piece of wood goes in this like that. If I didn't have that, I could do it this way, I could do it this way, I could do it all sorts of different ways, and I'd be wasting my time trying to fit two pieces that weren't meant to go together. So that's an important thing. If you're going to put two pieces or more of wood together, then the trick is to mark the pieces right at the beginning so you don't make the mistake. Now, the next thing that I need to point out is what is it that regardless of the kind of joint that you're making, what is it that makes the most secure and strongest joint? Well, it's pretty simple. The strongest joint is that joint from which you remove the least amount of wood equally from as many pieces as we're putting together. And you'll notice that in these two pieces here, the depth is exactly the same. If this piece were shallower, it would be stronger, but it would mean that this piece would have to be deeper. So that's an important principle. And it even harks back to what we did in a previous episode when we were talking about tongue and groove joints. This is the tongue and this is the groove. And in this case, it works into thirds. Uh, if the tongue were any bigger, this piece would be a lot stronger, but this would necessarily be weaker. So that's the important thing to bear in mind, that the strongest joint is that joint from which you remove the least amount of wood equally from both pieces. So, having marked this, how do we go about cutting this? Well, I would take a square, a marking square, or I would take, uh, take a little square like this, and I would mark down the side with a marking knife or a pencil, or whatever, and I would divide this in half, and I would do the same thing on the other side. Then, using a bench hook, as I've also mentioned before, there's very little that you do freehand. If I put this on the bench hook and then take any convenient saw, there's a saw here, for example, a little pistol tip saw, and if I use the same saw that I use to make the curve, I can slide this along and without even looking, I can saw guaranteed perfectly straight and perfectly square until I get down to the mark that I've made in the middle of the wood. 
I'll do that several times all the way across. I will then put this piece of wood on here and scribe the width of that and do exactly the same thing with this piece of wood. Putting the saw in the kerf that the saw made, I will saw down all the way across several times. At this point, if I've been careful to only saw down to the line that I scribed there, it's a relatively easy thing to take any convenient chisel. Here's a chisel here, for example. And once again, using my bench hook here with the blade, the bevel down, I can clean out the waste. You'll notice that this doesn't have to be perfectly smooth. If I've made a lot of cuts down here, they, they tend to come out perfectly smooth anyway. But in doing all of this, the thing that guarantees me success is the fact that I took the trouble to mark how the pieces go. G, B. So I know that they will fit perfectly. Now, if you want to try that, I would suggest you do that. But now I'm going to give you a little challenge. After you've done this, I'd now like you to take another piece of wood and make a mitered half lap joint so that it goes together like this. Sometimes if you're making frames or drawer containers, this looks a whole lot nicer. Uh, you might not want to see the squareness like that. But there's a little trick to this, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. I want you to try it out, first of all, and see if you can make a mitered half lap joint. So I hope you like that. If you remember, go to the website. You can find the books. You can find out how to take classes and lessons and whatever. Uh, and come back soon, and we'll get into an ever more increasingly complex joint. Thank you. Thank you.